after the teachings, uh, we will have some time for small group fellowship, a chance to partake of friendship and companionship in a small group setting. And then we'll come back together. Um, we'll um, perhaps spend a couple of minutes taking your questions. And um, uh, then I'll try to leave us with a practice to hold as a meditation for the next uh, few weeks until we meet again. So Bismillah, uh, I hope you have your halal beverage of choice ready. Uh, I join you today with uh, chai as God intended it, uh, desi style chai with cardamom and uh, raw sugar and uh, a tea that was good enough that it led uh, some forces of the empire to go and try to colonize the rest of the world for it. Uh, you might have your own beverage of choice. So whatever it is, I hope that it is something that brings you joy, uh, that uh, you are able to sit comfortably for the next hour or so, and um, that you will enjoy the company of these friends. Some of these friends are going to be new to you, and some of them might be friends and dear ones uh, that you've been looking forward to getting together with again. I'm going to take one minute and to scroll across the screen uh, to see your beautiful faces. And it's, a, it's always a joy to imagine that some of the faces of the people whom you may not know yet, uh, that with time, they could become people who are very dear to you. Maybe some of our friends who are a little shy and there's a, a black screen. Maybe that shyness is an invitation to linger at their doorstep just a little bit to see if we are called in or allowed in. And it turns out that that's actually one of the themes for our discussion for today. Uh, we are going to Mount Sinai. Literally, no, uh, metaphorically. We are going to go in the footsteps of Musa, alayhi salam, of Moses, peace be upon him, when he comes to the mountain and he asks to see the face of God. And God answers to him, you cannot see me. Why would it be that we would desire to see the face of God? And why would it be that the response would come back? Lantarani, you cannot see me. This dynamic of Arani, I want to see your face. And Lantarani, you will not see my face, has been one that the sages of our tradition spend a lot of time playing with, sitting with, exploring, examining. And by now, if uh, you've been with us before, you know that these are friends who know that sometimes there's more to things than first meets the eye. So sometimes a no is a no, and sometimes a no is a yes, but in a different way than you might have imagined. So what is it that the Sufis, the poets, uh, the sages, the dreamers, the lovers, how have they come to interpret this? Uh, over the course of the time that we have, we'll take a look at what some of the great sages of our tradition, people like Molana Rumi, Shamsa Tabrizi, Ibn Arabi, and the family of the Prophet, 
have all come to interpret this. But we'll get to that after we start with some sacred sound. And this sacred sound comes to us courtesy of one of the friends who oftentimes joins us. I haven't had a chance to scroll all the way through to see if she's with us for today, but um, Nizamun Nissa, um, Aida Hussein, dear beloved friend uh, from the Toronto area who hails from the magical land of Pakistan, the Lahore region. And um, it turns out that she has taken a poem, which is a meditation of Arani and Lantarani. I want to see your face. You cannot see my face. Uh, as composed by the South Asian Sufi mystic, uh, Hazrat Inayat Khan, and she has recited it. The images that you see uh, are images from our journey back in December, just a month ago, uh, in Mecca and Medina. Um, so, uh, without further ado, we're going to listen to Nizam and Nisa's recitation of Hazrat Naid Khan's Makki Madani poem. Ah. 
we could just uh, stay <laughs> in that uh, sweet recitation of uh, Nizam al Nisa. Um, Divan Azal Sehome Makki Madanika. From the beginning of time, I've been in love with the Prophet. Uh, my only purpose in life now is to ask my cherishing, sustaining Lord, Rabbi Aranika, uh, allow me to see, yes, allow me to see you. I'm not afraid of hell, nor am I tempted by heaven. I am the moth that wants nothing but to circle its beloved. So you're kind of getting a sense of the ways in which this beautiful language of the Quran expands into the poetic tradition, into the mystic tradition, and becomes part of this yearning, this longing. What does it mean to speak of longing for Moses? After all, Moses is the most prominent messenger in the Quran. He's named more often than any other prophet or messenger. What does it mean for Moses to come to the mountain, to Mount Sinai, and ask of God, I want to see you? That's the question that our friends have been examining and exploring. I could ask our friends as you join, if you can make sure that your microphones are on mute. I would really appreciate that. It would help with the feedback sound. Yeah. Um, so let us, as we may, take a journey through the Quran. Uh, the Quran doesn't read like the Bible. It assumes that its readers, its listeners, are already familiar with the basic contours. Uh, that's why the typical passages in the Quran say things like, uh, remember the story of Moses? And then it takes you right to the heart of things. Uh, it is not a history book. It is not the history of the Arabs. Uh, it's not the history of a people or of a region. It is really the history of the divine encounter with creation as such. Uh, the times and the places where details are provided, oftentimes it's because it wishes to make a point or it wishes to distinguish something uh, from how it's been preserved in the Torah or in the New Testament. But it assumes that people have already heard these stories. And that's why the passages in the Quran, generally speaking, don't show up in one chapter. Uh, they are scattered across the whole Quran. And so it is with the story of Moses. Uh, there's a wonderful scholar who said, the experience of the Quran is almost like standing on a rocky beach and having an enormous wave come from the ocean and hit those rocks and get scattered into a thousand rocks. Why would it do that? Because our minds are like this. You might notice that your own thoughts wander. They shift. They don't stay constant. And so the Quran catches you <laughs> wherever your mind is wandering. And so the passage of Moses coming to have this encounter with the divine 
shows up in a few different passages in the holy text. So we're going to go and to see where this journey takes us. We will begin with a recitation of the verse that is the part about this tension between I want to see your face. No, you cannot see my face. It's about just one minute. <laughs> Let's take a look at um, what it is that um, that we have going on. Excuse me. Uh, here. So we have the story that Moses comes to a miqat, uh, that appointed time and place, appointed time and place. Uh, those of us who were just on our journey of Umrah, you know that there's a place called the miqat, where you change out of your ordinary clothing and you switch into uh, a simple outfit to come to God. You make a vow of purification of the heart. And specifically, you make a vow to not harm any living creature, not even yourself. Uh, you will not pluck a single strand of hair from you. What does it mean to think of the miqat, the place that we have to come to in order to see God as a place that we make a vow literally not to harm the hair of a living creature? What does it mean to think about that encounter with the divine being predicated, first of all, on the principle of cause no harm. So Moses has to come to this place. Moses is coming to this miqat. And there God speaks with him. God speaks with him. Uh, if you've been with us through the stories of the prophets, you know that every one of the prophets has an honorific as a special title. Adam, Adam was a Safiullah, 
the one chosen by God. Nuh, Noah, was Najiullah, the one saved by God. Ibrahim, Abraham, is Khalilullah, the intimate friend of God. And Moses is Kalimullah, the one with whom God spoke. In fact, in classical Sufi discourse, when these Muslim Sufis wanted to refer to Jews, they would usually call them Kalimis, the people to whom God spoke. The people associated with the one to whom God spoke, the spoken ones. So Moses comes and God speaks to him. And Moses says, Qala Rabbi Arani. I want to see you. Show yourself to me. Undur Ilaika. So that I can cast a glance towards you. And Allah answers, Qala Lan Tarani. Uh, you will not see me. Walakin Undur Ilal Jabal. But look at that mountain. If it remains standing firm, you will see me. Then your Rub, your cherishing sustainer, revealed himself, Ajalla manifests himself to the mountain. The mountain crumbles. Wakharra Musa Saigan. And Moses faints, falls down as if struck by thunder. When he recovers, he says, Saponika, glory be to you. Tupto Elaika, I turn my face again towards you, and I am the first of those who have faith. And God says, Ya Musa, O Moses, I've chosen you, I've purified you above all of humanity as my messenger and through the words I've given you. So that's the verse that we're going to be sitting with. And what I want to do is I want to take us back to this place, to Mount Sinai, where this encounter is taking place between Musa and Allah, the place that is still a pilgrimage site. Uh, if you were to go to Mount Sinai today, you'll notice that there is a church and a mosque right next to each other. The St. Catherine Monastery has been there for millennia. Things weren't always the way that they are now. There's been times where we've had shared pilgrimage sites for Jews, for Muslims, and for Christians. We can get there again. But we've got to leave certain things behind. Leave some of this tribalism, some of this fervent divisive nationalism. And Moses is asked to leave things behind as well. What is he asked to leave behind? His shoes. He's told, kick off your sandals for you're standing on sacred ground. In the Sufi tradition, that kicking off of sandals is always a metaphor for leaving behind your ego, your egoic qualities. It's the reason why in Eastern homes, this is true everywhere from Morocco to Japan, when you enter somebody's home, you take your shoes off. What does that symbolize? that I recognize that your home to which you've invited me is a sacred place. 
and I'm going to do my best to enter with my full heart. I'm going to leave my ego at the door. May this be that this interaction that we have is a heart-to-heart -heart meeting. Let's leave the ego out of it. Moses has an ego. And he's told to leave his ego outside of the holy ground. In another one of the passages in the Quran, this is coming up in the 28th chapter of the Quran Sharif. Moses has finished his terms of service to his family. And they come up to the mountain and he says, I sense that there is a fire over there. And I'm going to bring for you some news, some information or a little burning ember a little piece of that fire for you. He approaches the fire and he notices that there's a tree that is shrouded in the flame, but it's not burning. Think about what it is that he tells his family. I'll bring you back either a khabar, a report from it, news from it, information from it, or I'm going to bring you back some of that fire itself. Well, in the Sufi tradition, they always say fire is love. And the fire that Moses senses is nothing other than the fire of love. But there's a big difference between news about love information about love, description of love, and something of that love itself. What do you want of your religion? What do you want of your path? Do you want someone to bring you news about what the prophets experienced? I do declare that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah upon him, rose up to heaven and saw God face to face. I do declare that Moses went on Mount Sinai and heard the words of God. Or do you want to have the fire that they experienced? Do you want to have something of that flame, something of their experience, something of their love. That's if there is a demarcation between, if you would, ordinary institutional religion and a kind of robust mystical life that is grounded in that same religion, it is this. Do you want the khabar? Do you want the news and the information? Or do you want the fire itself? We're going to see a little bit about what it would be like to go to Sinai itself. One of our dear friends, whom I just saw his name pop up, and very happy that he is here, our beloved friend Noman. Um, he's a very creative, mashallah, artist, and um, very gifted with some of these new technologies, AI and what have you. So this is um, a creation that uh, Noman came up with. Um, the experience of Musa alayhi salam witnessing, beholding uh, this tree that is shrouded in the flame, but yet it doesn't burn. That's a beautiful image. 
maybe have the discernment in life to know when to use some of this kind of technology and how. Another image that he came up with. What would it mean if the fire turns into light? Uh, what's the difference between fire and light? There's a lot of conversations these days that many of us are having that there's a lot of heat, but not a lot of light. Right? May it be that our conversations are filled with the sense of light. And here's how the Quran describes Moses's encounter with God. He goes to this blessed place and he hears from the mountain, from the shajara, from this tree, anna ya Musa, O oh Moses, inni an Allah rabbul alameen. It's a strange expression. Indeed, I, I am Allah the cherishing, sustaining Lord of all the worlds. Indeed, I, I am Allah, the cherishing sustainer of all the universes. In the Bible, of course, we get ehye asher ehye, uh, I am that I am. Uh, what can you say about God other than God is the only one who can speak in this first person? God is the only I. It's one of the beautiful aspects of the language of the Quran. Sometimes we address God using the third person. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. Sometimes we speak of God in the second person. You alone do we worship, and towards you alone do we turn. And then there's those passages in which God speaks in the first person. Those are always passages of love, passages of mercy. Love and mercy are first person to God, not wrath. Or judgment. And here, in that most emphatic encounter of Moses and God, the divine I is repeated twice. Enni an Allah, indeed I, I am Allah. At the previous passage, we see Moses fainting, and now we're going to come back to why would Moses faint? This is a more historic miniature of the way that this passage has been depicted. So let's come back together. And now let's take a look at what some of our sages have had to say about what it is that led Moses to say, Rabbi Arani. Show yourself so that I can cast a glance upon you. And God saying, Lantarani, you will never see me. Instead, look at the mountain. As you can imagine, there's been a long tendency in many religious traditions to say, uh, you cannot see God. In the Bible, you have accounts that say things like, um, no man can see God and live. Even to mention the name of God would burn your mouth, for I am a man of 
unworthy and impure lips, we are told. Sometimes, in some parts of the Islamic tradition, we're told, no, you will be able to see God, but not in this world. You've got to wait a little bit till you get to heaven. That opinion is also there. But if you're coming to the chai sessions, you probably want something a little more cosmic than that. And there are sages in our tradition that have very much talked about how and why it is that we might be able to see God right here and right now. So here's a few of the playful ways in which the sages of our tradition have looked at this verse. Molana's beautiful teacher, Shams, Shams Tabrizi, he says, yes, God said to Moses, you cannot see me, you will not see me. This is because God is right in front of you and you don't see him because you have come with a preconceived expectation of how you're supposed to see God and what God is supposed to look like. Though God is right in front of you. God is so subtle, Shams says, that he passes by the sight, for eyes do not perceive him. In other words, if you wish to see God, one of the things that we have to learn to do is to abandon our preconceived notions about where to find God and what God will look like. Shams goes on to say, if you want to see God like that, like what you came with, you will never be able to see God. Instead, what is it that we are told to do? Look at the mountain. God, Tajalla, manifests himself to the mountain, and the mountain is crumbled. Shams goes on to say, the mountain is Moses' own essence. The mountain is no different than Moses. Moses kept thinking that he's going to see God outside of himself. But he had to realize that he himself is the mountain. He himself is a tremendous, majestic being who had to achieve groundedness and stability. If he could look into himself, there he would see God. As the Habib alayhi salatu wasalam, has said in that beautiful saying of his, the heavens and the earth cannot contain God, but the heart of my loving devotee suffices me. As long as you keep thinking that you're going to see God outside of yourself, you will never see God. You have to realize that that divine vision is within, is inside. And Shams, Shams Tabriz, right here, quotes another ayah of the Quran Sharif. La tudrikuhul absar wa huwa yudriku absar. The sights do not reach God, but God encompasses all sights. In other words, you cannot see God with your eyes, 
but you can see God through divine sight. That's why God is the basir, the, the seeing, and the sami, the hearing. Uh, when Imam Ali was asked, uh, do you see God? Uh, his answer was, I would never worship a God that I couldn't see. People said, well, how do you see God? And he said, not with the eyes of the head, but rather with the eyes of the heart. Ibn Arabi picks up on that. Uh, there's a famous saying that he attributes to the close companion of the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, the first Sunni Khalifa, Abu Bakr, in which Abu Bakr says, um, I never saw anything without seeing God in it and through it. And Abu Bakr says, and excuse me, Ibn Arabi says, how can it be <laughs> that uh, Abu Bakr sees God through everything? But Moses is not allowed to see God. He says, well, there must be more to this than meets the eye. And here's one of the ways that Ibn Arabi plays with this verse of the Quran. It's really helpful to see how many ways of reading the Quran there have been for our sages. Uh, they do not settle for the literal meaning of the verse. They develop this very playful way, poetic way, mystical way of engaging with them. So Ibn Arabi says at one point, when Moses says, Rabbi arani, Oh Lord, I want to see you. And God answers, Lan tarani, You will not see me. Ibn Arabi says, why is God putting this in the future? Why is Allah saying, you will not see me? Put on your Ibn Arabi thinking caps for a second. <laughs> because you cannot see God in the future. You can only see God in the present moment. So Ibn Arabi says, the illusion through the use of the future tense is that anyone ignorant of you, O oh God, in the present breath will be ignorant of you in the future. If you cannot see God here and now, you will not see God there and then. That's why the Sufis want to see God now, right here, right when this breath is passing through your heart. Remember that in the Quran, Moses goes to that appointed place, that miqat. The Sufis have always said miqat is from the root of waq which is the eternal now. The place where you go to see God is the now. That's why the mystics and the sages are called the children of the eternal now. So just a little bit more. And then uh, we might go to um, our breakout sessions. One of the beautiful parts of our tradition is that people have never been content just to keep repeating the same thing. Uh, every sage, every poet has brought their own genius, their own contribution. So imagine you are in Mount Sinai. You are 
witnessing and beholding God. You are listening to the words of God. There's a traditional saying that um, Musa, alayhi salam, Moses was so close to God that he could hear the scribbling of the divine pen on the tablets of scripture. قَالَ Show yourself to me that I may look upon you. There's this extraordinary Sufi named Sam'ani, and he says, Moses makes one mistake. He is witnessing God, he is in front of God, and he keeps talking about you and me. Why are you coming back to this language of a me that is separate than you? Molana Rumi would say, you and I have to live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. And Samani raises a point that's really a tremendous challenge for us in this day and age. And I invite us to really sit with this one. Musa alayhi salam is Kalimullah. He is the one who hears the words of God. He hears the divine speech. But what does he ask for? Rabbi Arani, I want to see you. And Samani says, every prophet, every messenger is blessed with their own gift. Moses's gift was to hear God. But Muhammad's gift was to see God. And he says, seeing God is not better or worse than hearing God. But every person has their own gift from Allah. And Samani says, the mistake that Moses makes is that he wishes to be granted someone else's gift. That's a really challenging statement for us to think about. If you can stop for one second thinking of Moses as the historic prophet and messenger of God, and to realize, as Molana Rumi says, that every one of the characters that we see in the Quran represents a tendency inside of us, then Moses is inside you and Jesus is inside you and Adam and Eve are inside you and the angels and the demons are inside you. What would it be like to recognize that you've been blessed with many spiritual gifts. But rather than coming to God through the gifts that you've been blessed with, to want to come through somebody else's gift. You've been given a path to God. But how often is it the case that we want to have somebody else's path? Maybe you've been given the gift of kindness, of service, of justice, of visions. But that's not good enough. We want to have that person's gift.
all that matters, as the great saint of American Islam, Malcolm X, said, is to come to God by any means necessary. Find out what your gifts are. Stop coveting somebody else's path. Your own path is beautiful. It's luminous. It's enough. That word enough is probably the most anti-American thing you could ever utter. In a capitalist society, we're never told that enough is enough. We're always told to crave more, consume more. Um, it always cracks me up that there is this English name, surname, family name. Uh, it's the name of uh, one of the main female representatives of that South Asian poet, mystic that we listen to, Hazrat Nayat Khan, Sharifa Goodenough. That's her last name, Good Enough. That's like the most anti-American thing ever. No American, self-respecting American would allow themselves to be named Good Enough. Because Good Enough is never good enough. There's always more. What if that's one of the spiritual lessons here? Explore your heart. Find out how and in what way, in what path is God being revealed to you and to work your own path. Let's start to wrap up so that we can get to our breakout rooms. I'll leave you with uh, two other uh, little gifts, insights before we go into our session. That same Sam'ani also has a different take. And he says, uh, if God had revealed his, her fullness towards Moses, Moses would have crumbled. Moses would have been effaced. Moses would have gone into fana. And God says, if instead of the mountain, you would have been effaced, that would not have done because I still have work for you to do. You're not done. I still have work for you to do. Moses needs to go to Mount Sinai and he needs to come back to his people. Our goal is not to be spiritual junkies wanting to just get high and to lose ourselves. There's no mistake in God's plans. Maybe the spiritual path that we're on is one of slow simmering cooking, the opposite of fast food, because God still has work to do with us and through us. So when Mulana Rumi gets to this story, he says in the Divan Shams, Jahan tu rastoman Musa kiman bihu shau raksan. Sinai is not a mountain. This whole world is Mount Sinai, and I am Moses. I'm the one who has lost my rational thought. And the whole world is ecstatically dancing. In other words, 
see the whole entire universe as the mountain that reveals God to you. Sinai is not a hill. Sinai is not a mountain. Sinai is the whole world. Let's um, wrap up and go to our um, sessions. And what I'm going to do is, let me see. I'm going to open up some breakout rooms for us. And we're going to get to spend some time with a few friends in here. What I'm going to ask, especially if this is a first time session for you, is remember that these sessions are an opportunity to share, to witness each other, to sit with one another. Uh, it is not an opportunity to lecture. It's not an opportunity to offer healing. It's not an opportunity to guide anybody else. It is simply an opportunity to witness one another. So we're going to go around and I'm going to invite people to take just a few minutes and to perhaps share something that comes to them about the topics that we've discussed today. And if you notice that a person is going on and on and on and they're monopolizing the conversation, after two minutes, feel free to just say, thank you. Thank you. And that's just a sign that um, it's time for the next person, the next friend to share something. So I've opened up the breakout rooms. Uh, feel free to join. We're going to take about 15 minutes in these rooms, and then we're going to come back together and um, share a little bit about what you have um, what you've had to offer and um, and maybe I'll even try to think of a spiritual practice that we can um, work on over the course of the next few weeks. All right, friends. So see you in just a little bit. Um, one of the things that comes up in almost every session is people sometimes ask me, you know, I want to learn to read the Quran. Which translation should I use? Um, and I tell them Rumi. Um, and I don't mean that in a facetious way. Um, I'm not persuaded, which is the Persian polite way of saying I'm unpersuaded, that the way to read the Quran is to read it cover to cover. Um, what I tend to find in the exactly kind of what we're doing, um, you know, this last week as I've been sitting there going through Rumi and Ibn Arabi and Attar and all these beautiful Quran commentaries, uh, my wife has been listening to me every like half an hour go, wow. And it's really as if we've never encountered these verses before. There's something about the freshness with which they approach these verses that um, we might have read the same verse 20 times, 50 times, 100 times before, but somehow we didn't get it. We didn't get it the way that they approach it. Uh, Chris, I think you have your hand up there. Yes, the at the Shabana also we were, we were talking about the one that you mentioned about the sandal. Yeah. So you reminded us about the Sufi, and because the one what I was familiar with the sandal as being you leave your sandal because you're staying put. It's a, it's sacred, but you are say, oh, I'm here, I'm not leaving, and then you introduce, but you take out your you leave your ego first if if you, before you want to stay put, you take out your ego first. And I thought it was a lovely one. It, it is. And, you know, in fact, in that verse of the Quran, when Allah says, 
look at the mountain. And if the mountain, uh, if it is grounded, if it is rooted, if it is remaining firm, then you will see me. Huh? Um, and we have such a hard time with that remaining firm in one place. Um, our thoughts have a hard time remaining in one place. And, you know, that's part of the reason why so many of the spiritual practices that were given, um, they begin with the breath. They begin with bringing attention, awareness, consciousness uh, to the breath. Hosh bardam. Right? Uh, to tie your awareness to the breath. And that's the key to that notion of remaining firm and grounded and, and rooted. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just in the interest of, um, we try to honor um, having these sessions last no more than an hour and a half. So let me um, uh, try to aspire for that. So I just wanted to show you a couple of other quick things and then um, have us be on our way. Uh, so there are some beautiful miniatures that depict uh, the experiences of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. This is one of my favorite ones of um, Moses and the company of men and women. Women and men uh, being around him um, and him receiving the Torah from, from the angel. Uh, a little reminder that um, in the feminist tradition, uh, there's been a long-standing emphasis standing again at Sinai. So this is a 30-year-old work from Judith, Judith Plaskow, um, which invites us to think about what would it mean to not only be the recipient of a tradition, but also to replicate that experience in our own life? What would it mean for you to be the Moses of your soul and to go to the Sinai of your soul? And that's uh, one of the themes that I'm going to be leaving us with. Um, and from time to time, in this way of imagining things that we have not so frequently gotten to do, um, so here's the beautiful mosque in uh, the city of Ardabil in Iran, where a person to whom I'm related by name, though not by genealogy, uh, Sheikh Safi, Sheikh Safi Din Ardabili, he is the uh, founder of what becomes the Safavi dynasty, the Safavi dynasty from Safi, again, no relation. Um, this is his shrine in Ardabil. And you go inside, and it's an absolutely illuminated, beautiful space. And here's the key thing. Uh, when you go to the inner courtyard, the verse of the Quran that is inscribed is that verse that we just read today. I am that I am. Uh, it's very rarely our experience when we go to mosques, oftentimes we're dealing with being relegated to the back portion of a room or to a basement or to an unventilated space. Um, maybe there's the local gossip and the infamous kebab versus curry Political fest. I wish it was that. <laughs> what if the goal of having a mosque would be a place that aesthetically and spiritually would serve as the architectural Mount Sinai where you come to encounter Allah? Uh, what if that was the goal of going to a place of worship 
And then you realize that just as the Habib, uh, the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, says the whole world is a mosque, and Rumi says that the whole world is a Mount Sinai, what if the goal of reading the story of Moses on Mount Sinai is to get to the point where we realize that every place that we set foot, if we have learned to take off our egos, can be a place where we hear the call of Allah. And what if that were to be our practice for the next month? That you literally and physically try to give yourself opportunities. I realize it's the winter time in the Northern Hemisphere, but roll with me, people. Every now and then, if possible, to actually have our bare feet standing on the Mount Sinai of creation and in our encounters with people to strive to that point of leaving our egos outside and to remain firm, grounded, rooted, and as Chris said, indicating that we're here to stay with people. We're not just hopping from person to person, transaction to transaction, uh, that we're rooted trees, that our roots are tangled with one another, and we're grabbing hold of each other. Um, that's our practice for this next month until we have a chance, inshallah, to come back together. Um, the very last thing that uh, I will do is just a couple of announcements for those of you who've asked me to occasionally um, uh, repeat uh, these things just so you kind of are aware of what we have coming up. What? Um, those of you who are inclined, in April, we have our Morocco program. I think we have four, if I'm not mistaken, four spots left in that program. Uh, that's in Marrakesh, Fez, and the desert. Um, that's an intimate program. It's our smallest uh, program, really designed to foster a sense of fellowship. Uh, shortly after that program, we're going to have, inshallah, our first retreat in Andalusia, in Spain. Uh, so that's in Alqueria de Rosales. Uh, it's a retreat center um, not far from Granada. And the theme of that one is on Molana Rumi. Uh, and in June, inshallah, we'll have our program in Turkey. Um, so if you go to the website, uh, you will see details and information about all of them. Uh, in the meantime, let me just thank you all for joining us in this little virtual tour in this uh, virtual Mount Sinai. Uh, thank you for coming with your whole hearts. Thank you for coming with the beautiful, beautiful insights uh, and the kindness and the generosity that you come to, uh, especially the small group gatherings. Uh, it means a lot to people. It means a lot to me. And I look forward to seeing you all and all of us again, inshallah, next month. Um, and uh, I will post the dates on those again on uh, online, but it'll probably be Saturday, the 24th of February. Uh, until then, I wish you all well. May God bless you. I illuminate you and make your lives whole. Right. Uh, Salam alaikum and khuda. Salam everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Salam alaikum. Bye. Thank you. Salam alaikum everyone. Salam alaikum. Khuda. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.
Many things, yes, yes. Thank you so much, Umid. See you next time, inshallah. Inshallah, I Mona. Thank you, you. So, so, thank you, Mona. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank Bye. you. Wonderful to have you with us. It was lovely to be here. Thank you so Always. much. Bye bye. Bye bye, Sabah. It was lovely to see you. Bye. Take care. Alhamdulillah. That was that was beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Profound. You know, I uh, I never quite know where these things are going to go, but uh, um, you're still recording, Omid John. Just FYI. <laughs>